All right, so we are doing our child of God, and I'm literally talking about how to be a child today. Um, I'm going to get more into that in a second, but first let me pray real quick. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that we have the ability again to come and worship as your people. Father, we know that we showing up, it's not about what we're doing, it's about you moving amongst us and inside of each one of us. God, we know it's a sweet presence to you, um, and we thank you for what you're going to do today. In Jesus' name. Let's turn real quick, I'm going to start with some scripture, let's go to Mark chapter 10. Verses 13. I just came off a long weekend. We played, uh, so this is what 35 looks like. We went to Iowa City with a bunch of friends, and we played board games till like 2 in the morning. It's funny, because everyone that I told I was going to Iowa City, like, oh, you're going to party. I'm like, no, I'm a pastor. I'm not going to party. Then why are you going to Iowa City? He's like, I don't know. It sounds fun, and we're going to hang out (laughs) and talk with my friends. But I'm exhausted. I haven't stayed up that late in probably 10 years. And I fell asleep like this last night on top of the blankets and pillows in my full clothing. I'm getting old. All right. So verse 13 says this. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And then disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. So has anyone ever, last week we talked about the imposter versus the authentic self. If we can do anything about the ringing, that's going to help. Sorry. No, we talked about the imposter and the true self. Did anyone like kind of ponder that about them, themselves this week? Anybody? Their identity, what you find your identity in? So the imposter, right, is the person that finds their identity in what they do, right? Whether that be a mother or some kind of job or some kind of characteristic about yourself. This is something all of us live from sometimes. We struggle to live from this place that if the way people perceive me fails, then I fail, right? That's living from this imposter mindset. The true self, the child of God, lives with this identity first, the identity that you are loved by Christ and a child of God, right? We have the freedom to be who we are, to be real about our struggles, to be real about our insecurities and about our fears. This week, I want to talk about these two dualities, living as a child versus living as a Pharisee. So everybody write that down. Child versus Pharisee. Now, have you guys ever noticed the wonder of a child? How excited they get about anything. I don't know if you guys have ever met my son, but he is a very fascinating little sucker. That's how I describe him to people. I've never, I don't know exactly what God did when he took a little bit of my personality and Dan's and mixed it together and made this kid, but he is the most excitable. I mean, he loves to live from his, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Yes, imagination. Dude, you were right there, Liz. Bam. He loves to live from his imagination. Like, if he will stop on a dime at any moment whenever I want to play some type of, like, imagine we're doing this. Imagine we're doing that. Like, he is all in. When he watches, like, a Disney movie, I've never seen the hyper-focused. I mean, it's just he loves and he has this awe and wonder about everything in the world. If I go hunting, I'm like, hey, buddy, I'm going deer hunting. Are you going to shoot it in the head and there's going to be blood and... He just lives from this excitable, like, imagining the greatest thing ever about every circumstance, right? Um, and I'm, hold on, I'm going to parallel this, right? I want you to think about us in terms of how we relate to God, right, and how kids are so wondrous. Selah, Selah in here, please tell me yes. Darn it. Shoot, she's upstairs. So my daughter was similar when she was young. She was obsessed with, oh, no, I can't do this. All right. Yes, I Sorry, you'll know in a second. She was obsessed with Christmas, obsessed with the tooth fairy, obsessed with all of these magical things, right? And one day, and I forget the story, and I tried so hard to find the video, but there was a video that I recorded of her when she was chewing me out because she found out I lied about the tooth fairy and that the tooth fairy wasn't real. I mean, sobbing, you liar, you ruined my life. 
How dare you do this? Because then once she figured out the tooth fairy wasn't real, then she's like, oh, no, Santa's not real. And she started, I mean, I have it on video, and I looked every over my computer. I cannot find it. If anyone by chance knows where that is, please tell me. But it is hysterical. But there's this scripture in Ecclesiastes that says this, For in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. And isn't it fascinating? Do you guys ever just kind of wish you could go back as a kid when you had no cares, no worries? All you had was imagination and wonder? Anybody else? Has anyone noticed that the more you know about things, the more knowledge you collect, there comes a greater responsibility? And that is what I think that that scripture really grasps. We become a little bit like God when we know what right and wrong is, and all of a sudden we play God and, don't, and we lose our dependence and wonder on who God is and how big he is. We think we have everything figured out. We think we have him in a box. We think we understand the world in its fullness. When in reality, we don't. We need to start approaching God like children. Right? But instead, instead of approaching God that way, we live as what I would call a Pharisee. Now, I'm going to give you some personal examples of how living as a Pharisee. When I was younger, I wish my parents were here. Mom and Dad, you're listening. I've used this example before. I'm going to use it again. So I, when, I was, when I was growing up, I was about 13 or 14, I don't know, maybe 12. I got this new fascination. Um, it was with females. <laughs> Has any other men went through a fascination with females at the age of 12 or 13 years old? Yes. Guys, I'm just being real. I'm sorry if this is inappropriate, but it's just this is real life. I debated on doing this, but this is real life. And if you know my mother, my mother was raised extremely straight-lined, very religious, what I would say. When I say religion, I mean there's a focus on the rules. It's all about what you did and what you did not do. Well, one thing we do not do is we do not look at women. We do not lust. That is one thing we do not do because that's what Scripture says, and that is correct. So what I did is one day, I'm going to give you two examples. I've used this before, but they're two of my favorite stories growing up. One time we're walking through a uh, family video or blockbuster. I don't remember which one it was. The guys are laughing because you guys know when you were young, you're walking through looking exactly what I was looking at. You're walking through and all of a sudden you see like a, a movie and it's got like a girl in a bikini on it or something. And so, you know, you walk by, you do one of these and turn back around. And you keep... <laughs> well, I got brave one week and I decided to pick up the movie and look at it. And mom turns the corner and sees me. And you have no idea <laughs> what that felt like. If you know my mom, you've probably experienced a little bit of this, but you have no idea. And what does my mom do? We get in the car, she's sobbing. <laughs> sobbing. And, and, and under, my mom has changed so much. She is filled with the grace of God now, but she was so, she, this was out of love, understand this. I don't want to make my mom look bad, but it was out of love. She wanted the best for me. My dad, of course, he cheers when I get home. He's like, yeah, my son likes women. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, so that was the same year that um, I, I, this was really stupid. I decided that I was going to get a J.C. Penney's catalog, <laughs> and I cut out pictures of the lingerie section, and I stuck them on the inside of my closet with tape. <laughs> like, <laughs> that was really brave and really, really, really stupid. So once again, we have this huge cry fest. Oh my gosh, my teenage boy likes women. Like. It's, <laughs> anyway, I use that example. I'm not really calling myself a Pharisee there. What I'm doing is mom and dad, although they had the right intent, right, they made the primary thing secondary and the secondary thing primary in that they were more concerned about me following the rules than me being in love with Jesus. You guys see that? Because all of us guys have temptations. All of us are going to fail to sin. But the primary thing Jesus is concerned with is our love and relationship with him. It's not on following the rules. One is legalistic, right? One is the way we're meant to walk. Now still, that was when I was young, still, I still focus a lot. I find myself, and I talked about this last week, is, is focusing on the results, what I'm doing, and the achievement, and how I look in your guys' eyes. Okay? That's living from a pharisaical mindset. It's not all about the rules, guys. It's about my identity. It's about the fact that Jesus loves me, that he's using me right now. That God, the fact that I'm preaching this message, God prepared these works 
for me specifically before I was born. This isn't about me. This, you guys are witnessing God's glory working through me. It's not me. Do you see that? So I still get wrapped up in that. Um, even this weekend, I had a busy weekend. I was out of town all week, or not all week, but all weekend. And that's hard right before you preach a sermon because typically the days leading up, I'm getting more and digging in and like I'm getting prepared. So the first thing I'm thinking is, oh no, this sermon's gonna be a bust. They're gonna see me and know that I failed. And like, that's where my mind goes. But the cool thing about this, this series is I immediately check that and say, no, this isn't about me. This isn't about my identity in your eyes. This is about what God is doing in me, right? This is about that my dad loves me as a child of God. Amen? So we, what's fascinating that I see this all the time, I experience it almost every day as being a pastor, we preach the gospel to you guys over and over and over again, yet still it's not ingrained, ingrained in our language. See, a child doesn't see the speck in his neighbor's eye like we do, right? We become this, we, we, we grasp the knowledge of what God wants, we grasp his law, and immediately what we do is we hold ourselves to that standard, but what we do even worse than that is we hold our brother and sister to a higher standard. We start seeing the sins in their lives because we know the truth now, and we start holding them to that standard. See, a child doesn't do that. Here's the definition of legalism. Dallas Willard says this, legalism, a claim that overt action is conforming to rules for explicit behavior is what makes us right and pleasing to God and worthy of blessing. Overt action in conforming to rules or explicit behavior is what makes us right and pleasing to God and, wor and worthy of blessing. Here's my own words. When we become legalistic, we think it's all about what we do, it's all about our actions, and that is what is going to get God to love us, for God to see us as righteous, for God to see us as right. There's freedom in knowing that you will never earn salvation. You will never be good enough for Jesus. I know that's hard, but that's also freeing. Brendan Manning says it this way, and I put this on my Facebook this week. I love this quote. Jesus did not die at the hands of muggers, rapists, or thugs. He fell into the well-scrubbed hands of deeply religious people. Society's most respected members. Do you guys see that? Jesus, guys, wasn't mostly concerned with the really bad sinners in the world. That's not who you see him rebuking in the Bible. You know who you see him rebuking in the Bible? The people who thought they had it all together. Right. Listen, and I know we all shake our heads, but here's the problem. Those stories about Pharisees are in the Bible, not for other people that you're thinking about. It's for you. Every single one of us, including myself, deals with being a Pharisee, deals with holding people to rules and standards that we ourselves can't live up to. Almost every time you fight, I want you to go back to your recent argument you've had with any person, and you're going to find Pharisaical language that you, when you used when you argued with them, where you were holding them to a standard you didn't hold yourself to, and vice versa. But imagine that you're like a child you know that the only goodness you have in you is Jesus, right? So what do you have to boast? The only goodness in every single one of us is Christ. It's not in you. What do you have to boast about? Imagine approaching a conflict knowing that they're, they are a sinner just like you're a sinner. The only goodness in either one of y'all is Jesus. How different does that argument look? Right? So let's go, I'm going, to tell, I'm going to show you an example scripture. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12. I should, I should have like defined this. When I say Pharisee, guys, for those that are new, um, this was a very devout religious um, Jew, basically, that followed all the rules they were looked up to, they knew the word, um, they held themselves in a very high esteem. That's what I, when I say Pharisee, that's what I mean. A very religious person. Okay. Here we go. Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 8 says this. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, the very religious people, they said to him, 
Look, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Jesus said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law on how the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had not known what this means, and here's the part that matters right here, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now, I want to I explain to you what the Sabbath was. The Sabbath was originally meant for this. You've worked your entire week. You've tried to provide for your family. You've gotten caught up in all the things of the world, which all of us get caught up in Monday through Saturday. And that day of rest was meant, hey, I've got to reset my mind and remember what truly matters. I'm going to rest from all of the things of the world. I'm going to reset it. I'm going to worship God and remember, none of this ultimately matters. What matters is you. What matters is my God. What matters is my relationship with him. It wasn't just a rule that you need to keep a Sabbath. It was about your relationship with God. But what do you see the Pharisees doing? They're taking the Sabbath, and suddenly now it's a rule. Now you have to do it. It's not about relationship. It's about did you do it, did you not do it? Here's this quote right here. A rest from pre- Here's what Sabbath, Sabbath was. A rest from preoccupation with money, pleasure, and all creature comforts meant getting a proper perspective in, relations, in relation to the Creator on the Sabbath. Jews reflected and put the events of the past week in a larger context, saying to God, you are the true ruler. I am but your steward. The Sabbath was a day of rigorous honesty and careful contemplation, a day of taking stock, examining the direction of your life, and rooting oneself anew in God. Did you see that part? Rigorous honesty and careful contemplation, a day of taking stock, examining the direction of life. Man, how beneficial would that be for us now? Examining the direction. What if you took one day every week and examined the direction of your life? And you said to yourself, man, I spent a lot of waste, wasted time on really dumb stuff that's going nowhere. The Jew on the Sabbath learned to pray, our hearts are restless all week until they rest again in thee. That is what the Sabbath was initially for. Worship was the main element and the reason for the Sabbath. The result of living as, as a Pharisee rather than a child is a Pharisee, you see, and I've said this. It's all about the rule. It's all about, did you do the Sabbath? So, there's this quote here I want to read real quick. The joyous, put that up there, the joyous celebration of creating and covenant stress by the prophets disappeared. The Sabbath became a day of legalism. The means had become the end. And I've said this earlier, and I want to say it again. Herein lies the genius of legalist, legalistic religion making primary matters secondary and secondary matters primary. Remember what I said, the Sabbath was made to worship God and reset our minds, but it became legalistic, right? The primary thing became secondary. So what's the solution? Let's turn, we're gonna go back to our original scripture. Mark 10, 13 through 16, you can look at it up here. And they were bringing the children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Here's a quote that followed that up, and I'm going to talk about it. You don't become a Christian by keeping the rules. You become a Christian by despairing your own righteousness and throwing yourself like a helpless person on Christ for his righteousness. That is the difference between a Pharisee and a child. A child throws themselves in the arms of their father when anything goes wrong. A Pharisee thinks they can figure it out all on themselves and they can follow the rules. There's two dualities in Christianity. There's more than that. Here's a couple of them. 
And each of us has to be aware of these in ourselves. The first one's this, sinner, saint. I talk about this a lot. You are a sinner that's saved by God. You are a sinner, but God sees you as righteous. This is a very hard and difficult concept for a lot of Christians to get, but it's super, super important that you understand this duality. Do you know why? Let's say I walk around and the only one that I remember is that I'm a sinner. That's good because you realize you're a sinner, but the problem is you're condemned all the time and you're beat up. What I realize is I live as a sinner, but Jesus died for my sins and I'm righteous, right? But here's the problem with living from just the righteous standpoint. I walk around unaware of where I'm sinning and hurting other people, and he's not exposing things in my life that need to be transformed. That's called antinomianism. It's an overperversion of grace. It's an unwillingness to look at myself and my heart and know that I'm a sinner just like my brother and sister is. So we have to hold these things in tension. I'm a sinner, but I'm a saint. The second one is this, and we're talking about it today. In yourself, in each one of us, is a Pharisee and a saint. Or I'm sorry, a Pharisee and the child. You have to look and see where am I being a Pharisee? Where am I being legalistic, both on myself and on other people? And then remember to walk as a child. And when I say child, that doesn't mean you're like a dummy mentally. It actually says, do not, it actually says in the scripture, I forget the scripture, if anyone remembers, shout it out, where it says, don't have a thoughts like a child. It, it's not in your thinking, it's in your approach to God. It's about throwing yourself like a child in your father's arms. History attests that religion and religious people tend to be narrow. Instead of expanding our capacity for life, joy, and mystery, religion often contradicts it. As systematic theology advances, the sense of wonder declines. The paradoxes, contradictions, ambiguities of life are codified, and God himself is cribbed, cabined, and confined within the pages of a leather-bound book. Instead of a love story, the Bible is viewed as a detailed manual of directions. Does anyone ever feel that? Do you read the Bible as a love story between a father God who wants relationship with you, or do you read it like a rule book? Do you see the difference? We're meant to be like children reading about the love of our father, not about what you should need to go do to be perfect. The child may make a mistake and do not everything they know their parents ask, and their father may even be disappointed, but they never second guess their love and forgiveness. Think about that. Think about your own kids. You have rules for your kids. You have things you want them to follow because you love them and you want the best for their life. But what happens when your kids mess up? You may get a little angry. You may get a little frustrated, but they're right back in your arms. You guys ever, you guys whoop your kids, anybody? You raise your hand if you whoop your kids. I don't know. I find this fascinating. I don't know if it's just true for me or if it's true for you guys. When I whoop my son, what I would call like biblically and well, not out of like, super rashness, but when he's done something wrong, and I'm like, okay, we're going to your room, and I sit him down, and I tell him why he's going to get a whooping. He starts freaking out. I give him three butt whoopings. He freaks out and cries and loves. Do you guys ever notice the amount of love and affection your child has for you after that? <laughs> anyone, and anyone with me, raise your hand if you've experienced that. Isn't that weird? They like, they're in, you just whoop their butt, and they're in your arms, and there's this moment of like, you know I did this because I love you, and they're like, I know you did this because you love me. That is how we're meant to live as kids, as children, right? We're going to mess up, but we don't have to fear God. We go get in his arms. Here's what it looks like. Here's a quote what it looks like. And Band, you guys can come. To live as a child is to open yourself to another person and to God to stop lying about your loneliness and your fears, to be honest about your affections and to tell others how much they mean to you. This openness is the triumph of the child over the Pharisee and a sign of the dynamic presence of the Holy Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. It's really sad to me that we live in a culture, even with friends, you got friends and relationships, where people can't be real about how they feel. They can't be authentic. They're so nervous about how they will look to the other person that they'll be shown vulnerable, that they'll be shown weak, that we don't, like, dudes. It's funny. Outside of Christianity, I know very few dudes that are friends that can be real. Be like, man, I really love you, brother. I thank God for you. 
Like, you mean the world to me. You know what I mean? You don't hear guys saying that because we got pride. We're tough. Right? Women are better at that, but still, to be vulnerable, tell people how you really feel about them. Will you put those last quotes up for me, Daniel? Spurgeon said this, let us not say, would to God my child, and this is in Old English, so I want you to bear with me. Read this, though. It's really good. Would to God my child were grown up like myself that he might come to Christ, but rather may we almost wish that we were little children again, could forget much that now we know, could be washed clean from habit and prejudice, and could begin again with a child's freshness, simplicity, and eagerness. As we pray for spiritual childhood, Scripture sets its seal upon the prayer, for it is written, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Do you guys ever put that parallel there? Unless we be born again. Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. I think that was the last one. So you guys can stand up. There's that scripture in 1 John that says, We love because he first loved us. And we often have to remember that, guys. To be a little child, your kids didn't come out of your womb loving you. Your kids love you because you loved them. Right? So as believers, we have to live from that place. We don't follow rules to try to earn anything. We don't follow, we don't hold people to rules like Pharisees and legalistics. What we do is we're like little babies. We all know we're messed up. We all know our God loves us right? So bow your heads. Father, I thank you for these people. I pray, God, that you would make us like little children. We know that you said we cannot enter your kingdom unless we become like little children. So we pray right now, Father, would you transform us back into that spiritual, childlike place where we can approach you like the Father that you are. Help us to stop trying to earn your love. Help us to stop focusing on other people's issues and holding them to a standard which we ourselves don't live up to. But God, help us just to love one another because you first loved us. All God's people said.